Um, but we've been in this series for the last couple of weeks now called Be the Church. And what's really exciting is that just two weeks ago, right, we celebrated our church's second birthday, which is a really incredible historical moment. So can we just praise God again for that? That cool thing, right? That, that this cool reality that we've crossed this, this two year mark, right? This cool story where it was just my wife and I, you know, praying for God to bring about this dream of starting a church in our community, right? So we started as a Bible study in our home and grew from there to, you know, the, 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 the hotel conference room that we have here in town. And then we moved to the museum and then, on September of 2018, we moved here into the school where we've been gathering. And, and even though COVID has impacted all of the dynamics of our church, we still are grateful to be a part of God's movement. Aren't we, church? Amen? Right? We're grateful to be a part of what God is doing. And so we've been in this series called Be the Church because as we've talked about, honestly, if, if you've been coming for quite a while, you've heard us say over and over again that we're not here just to do church. We're not here to be in another country club. We're not here just to kind of come and smile, look great, you know, like, oh, I got all dressed up. People want to look at me and think I got life all figured out. That's not what we're about. We're here to be a community, be honest with who we are, and just be honest, real people in life, and just encouraging each other forward as we chase after Jesus and love this community. And so we've been talking about, you know, what it means for us to be the church. Like, really kind of deep, right, beneath that saying, really in here, what does it mean for us to be the church? And so two weeks ago, we, we dove into this reality that God talks about us about in the book of Ephesians. And we discovered how um, in this book of the Bible that's you know, written for the purpose of helping the church you know, build its identity and understand who it is and what it's supposed to be, all these things, we, we, we're reminded that we are handiwork of God created to do what? Do good works that he wants us to do. So we talk about this reality how we are a church that is here to do the good works of God and bring his goodness to a hurting world. And we actually celebrated that, you know, two weeks ago when we celebrated our second birthday, we celebrated the fact that we've been a church that has loved this city more than we love ourselves. And that's been who we are since day one. And we've lived that through the ways that we've blessed communities, the way that we've helped people who are in need, the way that we've been there. And, and then we've, we've signed up to, to serve in different places how we've helped people and uh, you know, rehab facilities and the way we've blessed people and the, the, the foster group home in, in town. We've truly been a church that has loved this city more than it loves itself. And so we celebrated that two weeks ago. Then, and even just last week, we continued this series. We realized that, that God created the church, right, to be built together as a community for him to dwell in. We read that in, in, in towards the end of second, uh, the chapter 2 of Ephesians, this reality that, that God is looking not just for individuals to gather in a room and to go home and do, do their life, right? To go to their corners of society and do their thing. But God has this crazy dream of, of having the church be this community, right? That's, that's fitted together, right? There, there may be some... You know, some pieces that don't quite fit together, like you're taking puzzle pieces from different boxes and trying to fit it together. Right? It, may, it may look a little funny, right? All of us, we may have a little bit different personalities. We may be from a different side of the tracks and we may be of different cultures in these things. But this reality that God is looking for the church to be a community that's been built together, right? So that he can, he can dwell in us and he can speak to us. So we can know him, not just, not just be good people who try to do good Christian things, but be people who are honestly filled with the power of God, right? And the joy of God and the peace of God and, and all of these things. So we wrestled with that last week. And it was a great conversation. I loved, I loved our time last week and I hope you did too. And perhaps if you weren't here, I encourage you. Um, you know, we have all of our messages are on a podcast, and so if you are somebody who loves listening to podcasts, perhaps you're driving to work, and you get stuck in traffic, like all of us, and you love listening to a podcast, listen just simply wherever you podcast, wherever you listen to them, you can just simply search the Corner Church, scroll through, find our logo, and all of our messages are on a podcast form, you're able to follow along, listen in that way, perhaps you want to listen to something again, or perhaps you missed something, and and you want to tune in that way. But friends, this morning, I'm, I'm excited. And so I'm going to do something a little silly. Yeah? Can we just kind of bump each other a little bit and just say, are you ready? Just kind of let's do that to each other. Can we bump around and say, hey, are you ready for today? Are you ready? Are you ready? Because I'm, I'm ready for today. 
And so this morning, we're going to jump into Ephesians again and cover another element of how God wants the church to be, right? The identity of who the church is meant to be. And so we're going to look into Ephesians chapter 4. So if you have a Bible with you, I encourage you to open it up. And uh, we're also going to have it here on the screen as well, like every Sunday. Then if you want to use the YouVersion Bible app, I really encourage you to take advantage of that. If perhaps you are somebody who's like me and you love having app for everything on your phone, um, then you can take advantage of that. You take notes and all those things. Uh, the instructions on how to do, the, do all that is on the back of your paper bulletin. So if you want to use that, be great. But uh, let's jump into Ephesians and, uh, and really bring our, our hearts into a moment of God to speak to us. Because that'd be pretty awesome. It'd be pretty great for God to speak to us this morning. Wouldn't it be church? The creator of the universe to actually talk to us. It'd be awesome. Let's read this together. It's in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11. We're going to read 11 to 15. And so Paul, writing this to the church, he says this. He says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and, and teachers, right? All these different people with these different skill sets to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Listen to this, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Verse 14, he says this, he says, then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by, by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the, con the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful sch scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become every aspect, I'm sorry, every, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, and that is Christ. And so I know sometimes we read Bible and you know, we read God's word, read the Bible, and sometimes we get to the end and we're like, what did he just say? <laughs> but in this moment, right, God is, is drawing our focus to this reality of how the church is meant to be, this, this community that doesn't just come together and ha enjoys life and has fun. We be friends and, right, we hang out and we make our own theme songs where we fall into a fountain, right? But we come together as a community, right, and for the purpose of becoming these, this, this mature people of God. And, and growing in our walk with Jesus. And he says these things, and perhaps for some of us it's a little foreign, right? How often do we actually talk about what it means to grow with God? Like, what does it mean to grow with God? Because this idea of growth is something that's not foreign to us, right? We, we talk about it in so many other parts of our life, right? We talk about it in how we grow, right? I mean, in our in one of our door frames in our house, we have these little these little line marks of our of our son, right? Growing Mason, he's three years old, and every few months we line him up again, right? He tries to run away, but we got to throw him in the, like with a straight jacket, put him up against the wall, and you know, put a line above his head, and we see how he's growing, right? So we talk about how how we grow, and we our physical bodies we grow, mature, and all those things, and we talk about growth, right, in our, in our, in our knowledge, right, in our academic world, right, so uh, we talk about it and how we improve our grades and those things and go to school, what we learn, we learn new information, perhaps in our schoolwork and our, even in our job environment, whatever it could be, we grow, uh, we learn these new things, we grow with skills, right, where perhaps we work in a trade industry or, or whatever it could be, but we, dr we grow in what we're able to do, or we're able to, you know, before we would paint a picture of a bird and it, and it looked like a, just a giant mess. But then slowly and slowly that beautiful piece of art, well, that ugly piece of art became a beautiful piece of art. So you have some idea of what growing looks like, this idea of improving, but, but what does it mean to grow with God, really? And how would you know if you're growing with God? How would you know if you were a mature Christian? And all those things. How would you know? You see, I, I believe that perhaps for quite some time, and this is especially true if you've grown up in church, if you've grown up in church your whole life or been at some point prior to this moment, and if, if, if not, then how amazing it is that you are here in this moment, but especially if you've grown up in church, I, I believe that 
we've developed this idea of what it looks like to be people who grow in our faith. And we have this idea of what it looks like that is so far off from what God is wanting to do in us. Cyrus, if you want to jump back real quick, we're not there yet, brother. But I remember a few months ago, I was sitting with a friend. We were having breakfast, and we had some coffee and some pancakes and all those delicious goodness. And, and we were talking with each other. And I remember he shared something with me that kind of caught me a little off guard. You ever have a friend who kind of, you know, when you're hanging out, shares this little thing with you that's a, it's a little out of the ordinary? I remember we were sitting there, and we were enjoying our time together, and he simply looked at me, and he said, you know, Andre, I'm, I'm having a really hard time being a good Christian. And obviously, you know, my, your antennas go up, you're like, huh? I'm like, okay, what do you mean? I'm having a really hard time doing this Christian thing because I can't ever seem to get it right. He shared, you know, I've, you know, I've grown my whole life in a church-going family, right, with these conservative Christian values and all these things. And I've been told, you know, at camp and all these different places and how I need to be and how I need to look because I'm not allowed to do all these things. I'm supposed to, you know, that's of the world, right, all that language. I'm not supposed to be any of those things. But I'm, I'm having a hard time not doing it. And I feel like I'm not good enough as a Christian. And I really feel like I'm about to just throw on the towel and walk away from this thing. Because I just can't seem to get it right. Have you ever been in a moment like that? Because for a lot of us, we have this perception that to follow God means that we produce some kind of result. Right? To be a person of faith or to follow Jesus, we have this idea that we've got to do these things and check off these boxes if we're going to be a good Christian. And we talk about these, these habits that we've got to have. And so, Cyrus, we now, we're, we talk about growing with God. It's all about this idea that, that habits are, are what it means to grow with God. And so we feel like we're growing when we're doing more for God, right? We start by, we start by going to church, right? Oh, I'm doing great going to church. So we, then we start by trying try not to cuss as much and all those things. We try, oh, you know, I, I know that I shouldn't be drinking as much. I shouldn't be smoking, doing drugs. All these things. So we're going to check off all these boxes. We're going to stop doing these things. And we say, you know, I'm, I'm starting to look good, right? I'm starting to look clean. I'm starting to look sharp. All these things. I'm starting to do the right thing. But what happens is that if you've been in that place, of trying to make the core of what it means to grow with God all about the habits that you have and making sure that the list of your life is following this list, list of expectations of ways you should be and what you should do, then you'll notice it's an extremely shallow and bankrupt place to be. Because what I see happen as a pastor, what I see happen in so many people's lives is they, they come to church, right? We come to church because often there are things, things that happen in our life, right? Life gets turned upside down, right? There are issues in our marriage, issues in our family, issues in life. And so we just need some guidance. We need God's help. And so we're, we think the best decision is for us to go to church. And so we start going to church. And we have this, this excitement, right, to be at church and do the right thing, right? Our parents are proud of us or, or, or we're proud of ourselves for doing this good thing that we've been told our entire lives is good to do. And so we're doing these things. What I see so often as a pastor is that we start going to church and we kind of get a little excited. And, but then what happens is that we get to a place where it feels like all of our tires are popped and, and we feel like we're sluggish and, and we start to get angry. We start to get frustrated because we're thinking to ourselves, you know, God, I'm, 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 I'm kind of doing the right thing. I'm trying my best. I'm trying to be a good Christian. I'm trying to do what you want me to do. But God, you're not doing anything. I, I ask for your help with my husband because things are off between us. I ask for you to help with my kids because they're driving me insane. I ask for your help with things at work, but nothing is changing. God, why aren't you there? What more do you want me to do? And so we use language like, God, what more do you want me to sacrifice? What more do you want me to give up? What more do you want me to stop doing so I can be good enough for you to hear me. So we get frustrated, don't we? And we come to a place of getting pretty tired of pretending. I, I see it all the time. We come 
How you doing? I'm doing great. You're doing awesome. Life is great. God is good. I'm great. Politeness is so great. And we come to a place to be pretty exhausted pretending, don't we? Because we're trying to get enough. We're trying to quit these things and give up that and sacrifice this and be good. It's not making a difference. And so for a lot of us, we build this perception that growing with God is all about growing in our habits and what we can produce for God. And even for those of us who don't throw in the towel, if we continue to grow our entire life with this mentality of that's what it looks like to grow with God, then what happens is we become the very thing we swore we would never become. We become critical and judgmental. We become self-righteous. We become very prejudiced of others. We become very unloving. We become sour. All the things we swore we'd never be, we become. And I believe we've been robbed for too long with the wrong lens of what it means to grow with God. Because we know that we gotta grow, right? We know this. But we don't know how, we don't know what it looks like. And so we feel very lost. And this morning, I really want us to uncover a new reality of what it looks like to grow with God. You see, I remember it was shortly after Aaron and I had gotten married. We were young, we were broke, but we were crazy in love. I remember we were in college and we were in our first apartment. It was so small that if you um, turn the corner too hard, you'd run right into the wall because there's a wall here, wall there, wall there, wall here. And, You'd open the fridge and watch TV and take a nap all at the same time and use the restroom. And so our apartment was so small. But I remember when we first got married, I had this, this crazy idea, right? I, I was somebody who my whole life, I, I wasn't a car man, right? There were some people who grew up their whole lives and their dad teaches them how to work on a car and fix this and fix that. And I, I wasn't that, right? I never had that growing up. And, and, and I remember when we got married, I had this weird ambition that to be a man, I've got, to, I've got to be able to fix my wife's car when it breaks, right? For some reason, I had this, this dream. Like, if I'm going to be a man, man I've got to take care of my wife and all these manly things, and I've got to learn how to fix my wife's car when it breaks. And so I remember uh, she had a, uh, you know, uh, I think it was a 2000 Dodge Neon, and I remember uh, there, was the, the, uh, there was a part of it that broke. I remember it was the, the, the thermostat that broke. We took it to a shop. We weren't sure what was going on. I was having these radiator issues. It turns out that it was this, this small part on the engine, and I remember I just watched a YouTube video, and I'm like, Aaron, I got this. I've never done anything before. But I looked at her and I said, Aaron, I got this. Don't worry. Let me be a man. Let me take care of you, all these things. And so I can do this. I watched the YouTube video. I got this, right? You know, you know, watching YouTube is the same thing as an apprenticeship or all those things, right? You know, whatever. But I, I watched these videos. It looked easy. I just had to buy a few tools. It'd be a piece of cake. And so she's like, all right, sure. Go right ahead. And so got the car back home. And I remember I got all the tools, ordered the part, came in from Amazon. I was so excited to work on the car. And I remember I, I, I made sure I watched the video a dozen times. I memorized it by heart. And so I went out there one Saturday morning and I, I took everything off of the hoses and the clamps and all these pieces and bolts and nuts and covers and all these things off of the engine. And I got to it. I remember taking the old thermostat housing off and, and I'm like, man, it's only been 15 minutes. Cool. Here pretty soon I'm gonna have this baby done. I'm gonna walk it back in the house. Aaron's gonna think, wow, she married up, right? She did good. And so I'm excited to do these things for her. And, and I remember, <laughs> oh, it was like the wind all of a sudden changed direction. And my luck had run completely out. And I remember I put the new part on, and I go to grab a bolt, I go to put it on, but but it wasn't lining up. What? And so I remember I, I tried another bolt, no, and I put it back on, looked at it, put it back on, and all those things, and tried all these bolts, made sure I had all the right pieces, put it on, and, and, and for over an hour, I struggled with this small plastic piece, trying to figure out how to put, put it back on. I made sure I had the right item and all these things. I rewatched the YouTube video a dozen more times, and I'm like, I have all the things I need, but what am I doing wrong? And I remember, I remember probably Aaron was in the house. She could hear me yelling, right? She probably thought, well, Aaron's buying her part because he's probably throwing it across the yard. 
I remember I watched the video and I, and I saw how the, the serial number had been written across the top of the piece, uh, the top of the part. And I looked at mine and it was across the bottom. And still like a complete fool, realizing his <laughs> foolishness, I turned it upside down. <laughs> and the pieces went right in. And you see, I believe that we simply really need to kind of reverse our perception of what it looks like to grow with God. Because we've got it upside down. And that's why we're getting so frustrated. And that's why we feel so empty. And we're wondering, what on earth is going on? Why isn't God talking to me? Why isn't he doing anything in my life? There's this reality that our habits are actually one of the very last parts of our life that God is looking to change about who we are. Sorry, I said you can throw up the next slide. I want us to come to this reality that in our pursuit of growing with God, He's actually looking to begin at the core of who we are, our identity. And He's actually more interested in trying to make new this perception of who we see ourselves as before moving on even into our habits. He's looking first more to speak to and lead us in the making of our identity, which will then impact and influence our values as human beings, which will then help us kind of shift and mold our uh, idea of what's right and what's wrong, and our idea and understanding of morality, all those things, right? Which will then actually translate into a different way in which we live in life. You see, because I remember sitting there with my friend, having coffee and pancakes and enjoying a nice breakfast. And I remember him sharing me his frustration with God. And I remember I looked him in the eye and I, I simply asked him, who are you? Not in the, in the sense of who's, who are you? You're not my friend anymore. I don't know who you are anymore. But I asked him the question so that he would ask himself, who am I? We ask ourselves these questions a lot when we're in our teen years and some, sometimes even into our early 20s. But somewhere along the journey, we just stop asking, right? Sometimes we don't really know an answer. Or sometimes we pick something, we just settle with it. But this reality that God is looking to actually be more invested in the making of who we are before we actually get concerned with what we do this reality that the foundation of growing with God is not built on our behavior or the list of expectations that we can follow to a T. The foundation of us growing with God is whether or not the core of who we are is surrendered to Him or not. Because God is more interested in influencing and leading us at the center and at the inside than buffing and making look pretty the outside of our ident of our of our life in the outside. I remember when I was young, one of my favorite TV shows to watch was called Pit My Ride. <laughs> and now there have been so many other shows that have come right that we can watch, but I I remember loving to watch these shows because they take these beater cars, right? They take these cars that were just junk right these piece of junk cars they take them and they fix them up right and they make them look cool put some awesome flames and some metallic paint on the side make it look incredible but yet i would watch these shows and i'd see the cool sound system the cool seats the cool brand new interior put in but for some reason inside of me i always thought like why, why are they doing all this if they're not really working under the hood Right? Because, yeah, it's a cool looking car, but how much longer is it really going to run? And how much longer is it going to become more of a really cool yard ornament than a really cool mode of transportation? Because I always wondered, why aren't they looking to change and improve and help the health of the vehicle under the hood? They'll prolong its life more than making it look awesome on the outside. In this reality, 
this reality that Jesus is so much more concerned at seeing what's under the hood be given to him and be influenced by him than the list of expectations that we can follow really, really. Are you tracking with me, church? Are you, are you following me? Say yes. This reality that God's looking more at what's inside. And so when we ask ourselves that question, who am I? Who am I as a, as a, as a dad, as a husband, who as I am as a man? Who am I as a, as a mom, as a woman, as a, as a wife, as a friend, as a sibling, as a parent? All of these things, all these hats that we wear in life, as we answer these questions, who am I? How much of the answer is influenced by Jesus? How much of that is actually built on him? Because we have a tendency, don't we? We have a tendency in our, in our life to look for security and look for confidence. And so we build our identity on, on our job or on our kids. And so we feel good about ourselves if we're making a lot of money or if our kids are behaving really well. We put our identity on, on our relationships, on sexuality, on, on all of these things. We put our identity in whatever we can find that will make us happy. We put our identity in money and possessions and titles that we have and the people that we help all of these things in life we build our identity on but the reality is this all falls short together from building our identity on Christ and so it is a waste of time to look really good on the outside and to look like we got life all figured out if our heart is not really in the hands of Christ. If Jesus really isn't the leader of our, of our soul. And so as we're in this place this morning, I wanna urge you to embrace the new perception of what it looks like to grow with God. And to begin to see the wheels turning from allowing Christ to influence our identity and then influencing our values and then our, you know, our values and then our right and wrong, our morality, then our behavior. And then and the journey doesn't stop there. It's, it's this continual process of, of allowing God to make us new and refine us like these rocks in a tumbler that are bouncing off of each other, that are being polished and cleaned up from by one another that eventually become beautiful, glistening gorgeous stones this reality that is this process of being being churned and being rotated of of christ working in us and this reality that there are two things that god has given us to help us spin this wheel to see god do this work inside of us he's given us these two things it is christian community and spiritual disciplines he's given us christian community to belong to to not just go to church, but be a part of a community, right? To actually be invested in the people that we're in and to be a part of a local church and to develop an immediate circle of people who are also in a Christ-centered relationship who can encourage us and we can encourage them. And so there are these layers to Christian community. And we talked about all that last Sunday. And, and again, perhaps if you, if you missed it, listen to our podcast or watch it online, but this reality that God has given us Christian community to mold us and to sharpen us and to shape us and all of these things. And we're missing out on this work if we're not invested in Christian community. And then God has given us spiritual disciplines. He's given us his word to read, which I know can be a little overwhelming. It's a little scary to pick this up and read it. Because it's kind of foreign, right? We don't know where to start. We pick it up and we start reading all these words and hearing all these big names. And we, and we just don't understand it sometimes. But it's, it's valuable to begin to lean into other resources that help us understand this. Books that are built on this. These different devotional books or devotional podcasts or uh, these apps that we can have on our phone that help us kind of read this and chew it and understand it and digest it, all these things. God's given us the spiritual discipline. He's given us 
He's given us prayer, this opportunity that we can actually pray and speak with him. And in this reality, that prayer is not just us bringing our Christmas list to God, but it's actually us bringing our heart to him and saying, God, I need you. I need your help. Please help me, Lord. Would you please lead me? It's prayer is so much an act of trust, an act of surrender, than it is an act of requesting. It's not wrong to bring our worries and our fears and our requests to God. It's not wrong to do that. But understand that behind the scenes, when we go to him, we're trusting him. We're looking for his help. All these things. Prayer is a part of the spiritual discipline that God's given us. This idea of fasting and this idea of, uh, of uh, like I've talked about being in Christian community, this reality that God has given us spiritual disciplines. Like worship. Worship not just here on Sunday, but even in our own private situation. Where we're able to actually turn on some Christian worship music in our car on our way to work and actually like sing and not just <laughs> not just listen but actually sing and actually worship God in that moment like we do even on Sunday. He's given us these spiritual disciplines to help us in our walk as we are trying to be made new. And so friends, I, I urge you I urge you as you're following Christ as you're trying to grow with Jesus and you're wanting to see something real happen. You're wanting to see something real take root in your life. You're wanting to see your kids, your teenagers, actually know Jesus. Not just look nice and behave well, but actually know Jesus, then be more interested at seeing them develop their identity on Him and not in just rules and restrictions and principles and these things. God's given us these things to help us kind of stay within boundaries and to live healthy lives and all these things. But it will ruin our heart if we're not careful to make sure that our soul and our identity belongs to him first. And so friends, I don't know where you are, God. I don't know where you're at in this journey with Jesus and as a person of faith, as you hear me say all these words, I, I don't know where you put yourself. But I will say that God is excited for you to shift gears and to kind of give up this idea of just being a good person. I mean, not that we should forsake all these things, but that we've been equating good behavior with good faith. He's so excited for us to kind of put those things aside and to still walk in them, but to make sure first that our heart belongs to him. And so I don't know what you're hungry for God to do. I don't know if you've been praying for him to do something, if you've been waiting to hear some sense of direction, if you've been looking for his help, if you've been wanting him to step in in some way, if you're looking for him to answer some kind of prayer. I don't know what you're looking for God to do. But I know that your journey with Jesus begins. When you decide to say, you know what, Jesus, I'm ready to start building my life on you. I'm ready to stop measuring myself by all these rules and restrictions that I've been trying to do for so long. I'm ready to stop beating myself up and saying I'm, I stink and that I'm not good enough and I can't just seem to get it right. I'm ready to give that all up so that my heart can belong to you and that way I can actually know you that way I'm not really living in this religious kind of order but I'm living in a friendship and in a relationship with you I remember quite a few years ago this is the last story I share when I was in high school I had the opportunity to be a camp counselor 
at a camp out in Montana. Now, I kind of grew up a little bit in the country in, in, in Michigan, but I also kind of grew up more in town in the city. And so I remember being at this camp out in the country, Montana. When I say out in the country, I mean two hours away from Walmart. I don't even think Amazon Prime works there, okay? And so I remember being out in this place, and I remember being with these kids who were rough, who were, to say they were quite different than what I was used to. Quite a few of these young boys who were in fourth and fifth grade were probably more manly than me. I'm pretty sure I saw one eat a rattlesnake for breakfast one day, okay? But I remember being in this moment, we're talking with a few of them and talking about what it means to follow Jesus. And, and they asked me, so why do I have to start now? Why can't I wait to start getting serious with God when I'm older, right? I'll start being good when I'm older, and I'll start following all the rules. And why can't I just have fun and do what I want now and all these things? Why can't I just clean up my life later on and enjoy it now? I'm like, man, I was a fourth grade kid who just asked me that question. And he asked a question that many 40-year-olds never even ask. And I remember being there in the moment with these boys, and I looked him in the eye, and I said, you can do what you want to do. You can make your own decision. But following Jesus is not about how much we can give up to be good enough. It's about how we can know him more and know why he put us here. It's so much more about knowing how he cares for us and how he loves us and how he put us here on purpose, that we're not here on accident. It's not about trying to follow a list of expectations, but it's more about allowing God to fill the emptiness of our soul that we've been trying to fill with so many things. It's so much more real than just being good people. It's about knowing a great God who's never walked away from us. I mean, we may have beaten ourselves for what we've done, but God is still loving and caring for us. God has not walked away from us. He's not abandoned us. He's not walked away from you. And so you may say that, oh, God's a million miles away from me. But he's not. You may believe, oh, I've got all these things I gotta do before I can start. But you don't. It begins when you say within your heart and your soul that you know I'm ready to start building my life on you. I'm not on what I can accomplish or produce. I'm ready to build my life on you. Can we close our eyes in this moment together? I want us to have a, a private moment with Jesus. As we're all sitting in our seats and spaced out in the room and even watching online, I, I, I want to urge you. I don't know where you are with God. I don't know what you think God thinks of you. But if you're already ready to start something different and ready to start something fresh, then simply say within your heart that Jesus, I'm ready to build my life on you. I'm ready to give my heart to you. I'm ready to stop measuring myself the wrong way and instead measure myself by your love and what you say about me and why you made me. As we're in this room, all of us with our kind of heads down and eyes closed, having this private moment with Jesus. Listen, if, if you're saying some of these things with God, I would, I would love to celebrate with you. Would you mind just kind of raising a hand in the air? I'd love to celebrate with you. We're all kind of got our eyes closed. No one's looking around. It's just kind of us and Jesus and Pastor Andre. But if you've got this this work happening inside of you. Yes, I mean, that's incredible. If you got God speaking to you right now, you can feel it. Then don't push him away. Friends, we're going to pray. And the team is going to lead us in another song. 
And this song is about being ready or not to follow Jesus. And so I encourage you, stand and sing and worship our amazing King. Let's, sit, let's pray together and then we're going to worship.